Learning Module 2, Factors Influencing the Flexural Buckling Strength of Compression Members. In this tutorial, we're going to investigate the compressive strength of the W14 by 53. We're going to investigate its minor axis compressive strength for an L over R ratio of 90. This would back calculate to a length of 172.8 inches. We'll begin by defining the geometry. So select geometry, define frame. In our case, we won't have any bays, but we will have one story, and that story height will be 172.8 inches. Hit apply, and we have our column. We can now subdivide the member by selecting geometry, subdivide element. We select the element we want to subdivide, increase the number of segments to eight, and hit apply and we've now got a column represented by eight elements. By default, MassTan orients the element's local y-axis, or the web of the member, in the global xy plane. We need to now rotate all of those elements so that we'll have minor axis bending instead of the default major axis bending. Before doing this, let's see that web axis. Select View, Labels, an element local Y. You can now see some blue tick marks that have shown up. These tick marks uh, represent the element's local Y axis, or the plane of the web of the member. So if we did not reorient these members uh, and we were to do analysis in the XY plane, then all of our elements would be subject to major axis bending. So as I said before, we'll need to rotate these elements. To do this, we'll go under geometry, reorient elements. We'll select all for all elements and we'll set the rotation angle to 90 degrees. Hit apply and all of the elements have been rotated by 90 degrees. Note that you can no longer see the blue tick marks. That's because they're pointing out at you. We'll now go back and turn off those blue tick marks as well as the element in node labels. Under view, select labels, and select element web. We'll also turn off the node labels, view, labels, node numbers. And finally, we'll turn off the element labels, view, labels, element numbers. We'll now go on and define the section and material properties. We'll select properties, define section. We could type in all the values down at the base, but instead we'll use the AISC database. To do this, select database. We'll now scroll down and find our W14 by, W14 by 53. There it is, we'll now click on it. You can see the values have been typed in for us, but in order to save it as section one, we will need to hit apply. We'll now go on and attach that section property to all the elements. So we'll select Properties, Attach Section, Which Elements, we'll select All, and then we'll hit Apply. In a similar way, we'll define and attach the material properties. Under Properties, Define Material. In this case, we'll just type in the word Steel as the name. We'll provide an E value, which will be 29,000. And we'll provide an FY value, in our case, 50 KSI. Note that the weight density is set at zero. This means during all of our analysis, the self weight of the members will not be included. We can now hit apply, and material one has been defined. Under properties, attach material, we can now attach that steel property to all of our elements. We'll select all, and then we'll hit apply. Our section and material properties have now been defined and attached to all elements. We'll now go on and define the boundary conditions. Under conditions, first we'll define the fixities. Select define iron fixities. At the bottom of the screen, you can see the six degrees of freedom for each node. In our case, we're going to be supporting the base of the column with a pin. So we'll select X and Y, meaning we're going to restrain the X and Y displacement. We'll select that node so it's in the list, and then we'll hit Apply. 
We'll then clear the list. We'll release the Y displacement, so the node will only be restrained in the X. And we'll select the top node on the column and hit Apply. With our support conditions now defined, we'll go in and define the forces. So under Conditions, we select Define Forces. In our case, up on this top node, we'll place a 100 kip force in the downward direction. In PY, we'll type in minus 100. Hit Apply, and that force is now on the column. Our model has now been defined and ready for analysis. First, let's compute the compressive strength using a second order inelastic analysis. Under analysis, we'd select second order inelastic. Down at the base, we'll need to change the analysis type from space frame to planar frame. We'll put that 100 kips on in 1% increments, so we'll change the increment size to 0 0.01. We're going to need a lot of increments, so we'll type in, say, 10,000. We won't need all 10,000. And we'll run our applied load ratio up to a maximum of 100, but again, uh, we won't need to go quite that high. Noting that our model does not have an imperfection, we'll run the case with no imperfections included. We'll also look at the case where we will not investigate partial yielding accentuated by residual stresses. You'll note down at the bottom there is the modulus. You can see that it's set to E. This is implicative that no partial yielding accentuated by residual stresses will be included. Later we'll go back and change that. We'll now hit apply and our analysis will be completed. You can notice in the status box that the applied load ratio of 5.54 resulted in the limit load of the structure being reached. So in other words, we've failed this column at 5.54 times the 100 kips, or 554 kips. Let's see what the display shape looked like. So we'll go into Results, Diagrams, Deflected Shape, and then hit Apply. The deformed shape isn't very dramatic. Basically what happened here is our column just kept being compressed until finally at 5.54 times that 100 kip load the column failed. In order to see any type of buckling or anything like that, we'd either need to do an eigenvalue analysis or we'd need to include some type of an imperfection. Before uh, performing those analyses, let's just go back and reperform the second order inelastic analysis, but we'll turn on the switch that will include partial yielding, which would be, of course, accentuated by the presence of residual stresses. So we'll select analysis second order inelastic. Down at the base, we'll toggle the modulus from E to ETM. ETM is a feature within Mastan that does a pretty good job at mo of modeling partial yielding accentuated by residual stresses. With all the other parameters still set to the same values, we'll hit apply. Now looking down at the status box, you can see that the limit load of the column was reached at a load factor of 4.78, or 478 kips, which is significantly lower than the 554 we found earlier. So the change was the result of including residual stresses. We can have another look at that deflected shape. So we go into Results, Diagrams, Deflected Shape, and hit Apply. Once again, we can't really see anything. The column was basically compressed. There was no initial imperfection to be amplified and essentially at a load of 4.78 times that 100 kips, the column failed. You've also been asked to do some buckling analysis. So let's go back and under analysis, we'll select elastic critical load. Down at the base, we'll define the analysis type as a planar frame, a 2D analysis, because again, we did not provide any boundary conditions out of plane, and then we'll hit apply. Now let's go and take a look at the deflected shape. Under results, diagrams, deflected shape, and then we'll hit apply. We can see that the column basically buckled in a single sine wave, 
in the buckling load shown up at the top, the load ratio was 5.53 or the buckling load would be 553. And this is interesting because this is essentially the same number that we got before when we did the incremental analysis without including imperfections and only using the elastic modulus. You were also asked to do an inelastic critical load analysis. So let's do that. Under analysis, we have select inelastic critical load. Down at the base, we'll need to change the analysis type to be planar frame, so we do a 2D analysis. And then we'll hit apply and the analysis will be completed. Let's have a look at the deflected shape. Results, diagrams, deflected shape. Hit apply and we can see the deflected shape. Again, we've got Euler buckling, but in this case, the applied load ratio was 5.05 .05, as opposed to 5.53, which means that the inelastic critical load is smaller, so the effects of residual stresses and partial yielding must be impacting the performance of our column. At this point, I would suggest that you save the model, uh, perhaps give it a name like LR90PERF, PERF for perfect geometry, because from this point forward, what we're going to do is change the geometry to include an initial imperfection. To change the geometry to include the initial imperfection, uh, what we'll do in this case is we already have an, a nice deformed shape shown to us. It is a sine wave. So let's use that as a seed for the initial imperfection. So we'll select results and update geometry. Down at the base, it's going to ask for some information. First, which node? So we'll use this as our reference node. So I'm going to click on the center node, node 6. I'm looking to include initial imperfection in the x degree of freedom in the x direction. And the value I'd like to include here is the length of the column divided by 1,000. The length of our column was 172.8 divided by 1,000. Hit apply, and our geometry has now been updated to include the initial imperfection. It's so small that we can't even see it on the screen, but if we went back under geometry and node information, we would see that that point has in fact been moved. So let's do that. So under geometry, select information, select node, and then click on that center node. Viewing the information down at the bottom, we can see that the coordinate, the X coordinate for node six is 0 0.1728. So it has been moved over just a small amount or L over a thousand. Now the nice thing about the approach we used is all the other nodes have been moved over proportionally. So we still have that sine wave and, but it's also now including that, of course, that L over 1,000. So to prove this, let's click on a node, say about a quarter of the way up the column. Down at the base, you can see its nodal coordinates are 0.122. Click on a node about three quarters of the way up, and its nodal coordinate in the X direction is 0.122. Let's now perform an incremental analysis and see what impact that initial imperfection had. So under analysis, We'll select second order inelastic. Down at the base, the modulus is still set to ETM. So we'll do an analysis that includes both the initial imperfection and the effect of residual stresses. Where the, all the, the other analysis parameters set, we'll hit. We can see down in the status bar that the failure load was 3.84 when the column reached a limit of resistance. This is indicating that we've got failure in this column at 384 kips. So by including the residual stresses and an imperfection, we've now gone from 478, which did not include the initial imperfection, but did include the residual stresses, to 384, which includes both the residual stress effect and the initial imperfection. Let's have a look at the deflected shape. So go under results, diagrams, deflected shape and then hit apply. Because the initial geometry had a small imperfection, it was magnified as we put more and more load on there when we performed the incremental second order inelastic analysis. Again, up at the top, we can see that the applied load ratio at failure was 3.84, where the column failed by 384 kips when we included both residual stresses and an initial imperfection. You can now go back to perform a second order inelastic analysis with the modulus reset to E, 
then you can find out what would happen now if the column had an imperfection but no residual stresses. This concludes Learning Module 2.